So today we're going to be learning about simplifying radicals, um, which you learned in some point in geometry, so this should not be completely new to you. It was also taught a little bit in Algebra 1. But for Algebra 2, we definitely need to cover it a little bit more in depth than we did in either one of those other classes. So to begin with, a radical is most commonly referred to as a root. Um, typically, so for example, we typically call it a square root. That is most frequently what we use to describe radicals. So this next piece is incredibly important that you comprehend. Um, it's not going to affect anything that you do today, but you need to understand it and what the implications are. So um, if you have this symbol, which we always say square root of x, there is technically, um, it's the square root of x, that's for sure, square root of whatever it is. There is technically a 2 here that is outside of the radical symbol. So this implies that there are things like a cube root where instead of um, just the radical symbol, there's a three there, and you're gonna see those in algebra two. Um, it also implies that there are bigger things. There is also, for example, a fourth root. Um, again, we won't talk about those a whole lot. We'll deal with cube roots in the uh, second semester, but we won't deal with them now. But it is important that you understand um, that there is, in all of the roots that we will deal with today, that there is an understood two here. And the reason that is, is because you're looking for the factors of something that come in groups of two. So y'all are usually pretty good with square roots, just your basic ones, like square root of 16. Um, you can tell me easily that it's positive four and negative four. Maybe forget that um, negative four sometimes, but it is four and negative four, which you could also write as um, positive and negative 4. So this symbol you will see a whole lot in Algebra 2. It's just um, really it's just about uh, math people being lazy and instead of writing the same thing twice with different signs we write a positive negative 4. But I need you to understand why the square root of 16 is 4. And there's a couple things that I want to point out to you in order for you to comprehend this. So the first thing is we need to remember what we just talked about, the fact that there is a 2 here. And the second thing is that we need to understand that 16 is really 4 times 4. So when I have the square root of 4 times 4, because I'm looking for the square root and there are two 4s underneath here, that is where the square root of 16 comes from. That's where that 4 comes from. This is going to make a little bit more sense in a minute. So looking at our next example... We have the square root of 121, which you probably know without having to do a whole lot of thinking about it, is going to be 11. Don't forget that it is a positive and a negative 11. So you can write plus minus 11, or you can write 11 and negative 11. Again, both answers are mathematically correct. So the problem comes when we end up with things like the square root of 90. 90 doesn't have a square root. So what we have to do is we have to figure out what our factors of 90 are. So I'm going to do this problem one way and then I'm going to do the next problem a different way. And I want to show you the two different ways that you can determine this. So one of the ways that you can um, figure out to the square roots is um, you can think about the factors of 90, which would be 1 and 90, 2 and 45, 3 and 30, and 6 and 15, and there is one more, and that last one is 9 and 10. So if you think about each of these, and we're looking, what we're looking for when we're simplifying these square roots is which of our terms are perfect squares. So that's what we need to figure out is of all of these numbers that we listed here, which ones are perfect squares? Well, we've got a couple. Um, one is a perfect square, and um, nine is also a perfect square. And we are looking for the biggest one. So my biggest perfect square was my 9 
times 10. So I'm going to write this as, instead of the square root of 90, I'm going to write this as the square root of 9 times 10. And the reason I want to do that is because when I'm multiplying two square roots, like I have a, or sorry, the square root of 9 times 10, if I'm multiplying two things underneath the radical, I can rewrite that as two separate square roots. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago on one of our bell ringers, that we could actually write this as the square root of 9 times the square root of 10. And that helps us because the square root of 9 is really 3. I cannot simplify the square root of 10 because it doesn't have a perfect square. So my final answer would be the positive and negative form of three square roots of 10. So when I solved this problem this way, what I did, so really I just followed these five steps. The first thing I did was I listed out all the factors of 90. And that is where my um, 1 times 90, 2 times 45, 3 times 30, 6 times 15, and 9 times 10 came from. Then the second thing I did was I determined which of my factors were perfect squares. Um, and that's the ones I highlighted in yellow. So we said that 1 was a perfect square and that 9 was also a perfect square. Then I identified which of those was the biggest perfect square. And the biggest perfect square was this 9. So I used that 9 times 10 here. And then I rewrote the square root using these factors. So this is the part where I had the square root of 9 times the square root of 10. That's what I'm talking about here. And then I simplified the perfect square. And the way that I did that first was I um, split it up and I wrote it out as two um, radicals. And then I simplified the one that I could simplify. That square root of 9 became the positive and negative square root of 3. So that's just a list of steps that you could follow because some of you I know are step people. You need to know step one, I do this. Step two, I do this. Step three, I do this. So these are the steps that you can follow. So I'm going to do the next problem a little bit differently because some of you are like, yeah, I don't know where you got those numbers from. So the next problem says the square root of 60. And the second way that I'm going to do this, again, is going to be completely different. So um, if you got lost in the first way, then um, maybe this will make a little bit more sense to you. And if the first way made complete sense to you, then this may seem like a lot of work. Neither one of them is wrong. You just have to figure out which one is going to be the best one for you. So the second way that I'm going to do this is I am going to, first of all, prime factor 60. That means I'm going to take 60 and I'm going to draw a factor tree and um, list out the two things and multiply to give me 60. Well, 60 I know is 2 times 30. I'm going to mark out that 60 because I split it into two things. Um, 2 doesn't factor anymore, but I can factor 30 into 2 times 15. So I'm going to mark out that 30 because I've split it. Again, 2 doesn't factor, but I can split 15 into 3 and 5, again, going to mark out that 15. So if I take all of my end numbers, my 2 here, my second 2, my 3, and my 5, then I can rewrite the square root of 60 as the square root of 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. And you can verify that this is correct because you can multiply these numbers back together. Um, just going in order, 2 times 2 is 4, times 3 is 12, and 12 times 5 is 60. Um, and since this is, and this is critical that you understand, that since this is a square root that we are looking for, we are looking for numbers in our factorization that showed up in pairs. Well, notice I had a pair of two, so I'm looking for groups of two. Well, I have t a pair of twos, so that means that I can rewrite this as two on the outside. And the reason that this 2 goes on the outside is because there was a pair of 2's on the inside. So basically, um, you could essentially think of this as um, square root of 2 times 2 is really the square root of 4. And the square root of 4 is where that 2 comes from. And then my radical sign, 
or my square root sign. And then 3 and 5, I can't do anything with that, so I'm just going to leave it as 15. And again, like before, I have to have the positive and the negative form of this answer. So my simplified form of square root of 60 would be positive and negative 2 times the square root of 15. All right, and just to go back through steps, because again, I know some of you are steps people. Uh, the very first thing I did was I prime factored 60. That means I wrote 60 in a factor tree, and I listed out, I found all the prime factors. Um, the next step that I did was step two, was I rewrote 60 as a product of its primes. Um, and that is what I did here when I rewrote uh, 60 as 2 times 2 times 3 times 5, which I got from all of my end numbers in my factor tree. The next thing I did was I looked for pairs of prime factors, which came from when I looked for this 2 times 2 here, and those pairs came outside, which is where I got that 2 that was on the outside. So I pulled the pairs outside, and then I left the non-pairs inside. So whatever my non-pairs were, that's what ended up on the inside. Um, sorry, that doesn't say inside. That should say inside. Um... But so those non pairs end up on the inside, which is where that 15 came from. So for this problem, I'm actually going to work it out both ways because I want you to see that essentially they really are the same thing. So um, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to factor 126. I'm going to look for all of my factors of 126. Well, I know 126 is 1 times 126, it is also 2 times 63, um, it is 3 times 42. Um, it is also 6 times 21, and it is 7 times 18, and um, it is 9 or 14 times 9, or 9 times 14, let me write that in that order first, so 9 times 14. Um, so now that I have all of these written, so I'm going doing this one the way that I did the very first one, and I'm looking for perfect squares in here. So my perfect squares, 1 is a perfect square, um, and 9 is a perfect square. So those are the only two perfect squares that show up in this factorization. So once I find my perfect squares, I'm looking for which of those two, 1 or 9 is the biggest. Well, obviously 9 is the biggest of those two. So that means that I'm going to use 9 times 14 to rewrite 126. So the square root of 126 is really going to be the square root of 9 times 14, which you can break down as the square root of 9 times the square root of 14. And the square root of 9 is positive and negative 3. And then I can't take the square root of 14, so I'm going to leave this as the square root of 14. So the positive negative 3 times the square root of 14 is going to be my final answer. So this is the first way we can do this. So I'm going to just make this a little bit smaller. And then I'm going to rewrite this problem. And I'm going to do this by prime factoring. So I'm going to do the square root of 126. So if I'm going to do the second method, okay, so let me draw a line here. This was the first method that I taught you. Um, and then, oops, that was a terrible looking S. And then now we're going to do the second method, which is where we're looking for our prime factors. So 126, if I prime factor it, if I do a factor tree, well, I know that's 2 times 63. I'm going to mark out 126 because I factored it. I can't factor 2, but I can factor 63. 63 is 7 times 9. Um, I can't factor 9, but I can factor... I'm sorry, I can't factor 7, but I can factor 9, which is 3 times 3. So that 9 is gone. So my square root of 126 is really the square root of all of those n numbers. So 2 times 3 times 3 times 7. Um, and I just, just for what makes sense to me, is I took all of these end numbers and I just wrote them in numerical order. So notice I had a 2, um, which I still have a 2 here. Um, I had two threes, and then that's where the two threes came from, and I had a 7. So again, I just wrote those numbers in numerical order. And what I'm looking for here, if I'm looking, if I've, like, prime factored it, is I am looking for my pairs of numbers. Well, I have a pair of threes, 
So that means that I can take that out and it becomes three on the outside. And um, on the inside, I'm left with two times seven, which is 14. And don't forget, I still have to have that positive and negative form. So notice that either way that I did this, I ended up with the same thing. I ended up with this positive and negative square root of three, or sorry, positive and negative three times the square root of 14, both ways. So whichever one makes the most sense to you is the one that you need to do. So my next problem is square root of 15 times square root of 12. Um, one of the things that we talked about in our previous three problems was that if I had um, the square root of, let's go back here and look at this, 9 times 10, I could write that as the square root of 9 times the square root of 10. So I can take this and I can break it into two square roots. So the opposite principle is true, that if I have... Um, two square roots, I can actually rewrite this as one problem. And so instead of it being the square root of 15 times the square root of 12, I can rewrite this as the square root of 15 times 12, which is really the square root of 180. So that is my um, square root that I'm trying to simplify here. So I need to make this um, just a simplified form. So I'm looking for perfect squares. So this one, I'm going to do it the way that I did the first problems. And I'm going to take 180 and I'm going to list out all of my factors of 180. And if you're not sure what your factors of 180 are, we talked about this with um, factoring, like actual factoring, factoring. You can go to y equals and in Y1, you can type 180 divided by X, and it's going to give you all of your factors of 180. So if that's your concern, is like, I don't know where to get these numbers from, then type this in the calculator, this one, um, 180 divided by X, and it will give you the numbers that I'm about to get in this table. So my factors of 180 are 1 times 180. So that's a good place to start. 2 times 90, 3 times 60, 4 times 45, 5 times 36, and then we have 6 times 30, and we also have 9 times 20. And our last set is 12 times 15. So these are all of the different possible ways that you can multiply and get 180. And what I'm looking for in this list is I'm looking for numbers that are perfect squares. So 1 is a perfect square. Um, 4 is a perfect square. 36 is a perfect square. And 9 is a perfect square. So again, we're looking for every single number that's a perfect square. And of those four that I highlighted, 1, 4, 9, and 36, I need to figure out which one of those is the biggest. So the biggest one of all of those is my 36. So I'm going to rewrite 180 as the square root of 5 times 36, which uh, I can separate out into the square root of 5 times the square root of 36. And the square root of 36 is going to be positive and negative six. Now, this is not a wrong answer, but this is just not like a correct answer either. So when we write these, we always wanna write the coefficient, or the, sorry, the number without the radical first. So we're gonna write this as positive and negative six times the square root of five. So my simplified form of 180, the square root of 180 would be positive negative six times the square root of five. Here I have a division problem. Um, the same thing is true with division that's true with multiplication, that I can um, separate these out and see what I end up with. So instead of square root of 14 divided by 27, I'm going to write this as the square root of 14 divided by the square root of 27. And I'm going to prime factor these, so I'm going to do these the second way. Um, and 14 is pretty easy to prime factor because 14 is really just 2 times 7. Um, just that doesn't require a lot of thought. 27, if I were to prime factor 27 
move over here to the left. So if I took the number 27 and I prime factored it, well, 27 is 3 times 9. Um, so 27 I can mark out because I factored it. 3 doesn't factor, but 9 does into 3 times 3, so I can mark out that 9. So that means the 27 is really 3 times 3 times 3. So I'm going to rewrite this as the square root of 3 times 3 times 3. And again, those 3's came from my prime factorization. That's where they all came from. I did not make them up. And if you multiply them back together, 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. So um, if I look at the top of this, I have the square root of 2 times 7. I can't simplify that because neither one of those is a perfect square. Um, so I'm just going to leave the top as square root of 14, really, because you might as well put it back together. It just looks a little better. But my bottom is going to simplify a little bit because remember, since this is a square root, I am looking for pairs of numbers, and I have a pair of threes. Remember, I'm only looking for groups of two, so it's okay that I have one left over. That's fine. So that means because I had a group of threes, I'm going to have a positive and negative three on the outside. So plus minus three on the outside from that group of threes. And then I have a three left on the inside, that three that wasn't in a pair. So this looks like not a terrible answer um, because it's, you know, I can't do anything else with it. I can't do any division here. Like I can't divide 14 by the square root of three or 14 by the three that's not in the square root. However, we have to look at what's written underneath here. Um, we cannot, we cannot, 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 under any circumstances have square roots in the denominator of our problem. We are not allowed to have square roots in the denominator of our problem. So with this particular problem, we have an issue because I have a square root of three in the denominator. So what we do is we call, we do what is called rationalizing. So we're going to rationalize the denominator. And now you're like, what does that word mean? Give me just a second. And the way that I rationalize is I multiply by what's called a helpful form of 1. That is what rationalize, the true definition of rationalize means is to multiply by, multiply by a helpful form of 1. So I'm going to go back and look at this problem. And in order to rationalize this, what I have to do is I have to multiply this by a helpful form of 1. Well, that means I cannot, don't write this please, I can't just multiply by 1. That's not going to benefit me because that's not going to get rid of that square root. But what I can do is I can multiply both the top and the bottom by the square root of 3. Let's talk about, first of all, why we can do that. The reason that we can do that is because if I have, just looking at this part, the square root of 3 divided by 3, that is essentially just 1. And if I multiply anything by 1, I'm not changing the value of it. So it's staying square root of 3 over square root of 3 is really just 1. But what that does for me is that when I multiply this, and the top's easy to figure out, because square root of 14 times square root of 3, um, just like we've been working on, I can go ahead and multiply that 14 by 3 and put it in one square root symbol. So 14 times 3 is going to give me 42. So this is really the square root of 42 on top, divided by, I still have this plus or minus 3 on the outside, and then square root and I have now 3 times 3. And I can multiply these two 3's together because they're both inside of a radical. And 3 times 3 is going to give me 9. So now in the denominator, I have the positive negative 3 times the square root of 9. Well, hopefully you recognize that the square root of 9 is really 3. So my problem is now, just kind of simplifying a little bit more, the square root of 42 divided by positive and negative 3 times 3. The only thing that changed was I took this square root of 9 here and I simplified it to be 3. And 3 times 3 is going to give me 9. So my answer ends up being 3.5.
the square root of 42 over 3 times 3 is 9. And I'm instead of writing that positive negative sign in the denominator, I'm just going to write it in the front. It doesn't matter where it is, but it has to be part of the problem. So this would be my final answer. Positive and negative square root of 42 divided by 9. So just reiterating what we just did is we did what's called rationalizing the denominator, which meant I multiplied by a helpful form of 1. So I multiplied by square root of 3 over square root of 3. And notice that you have to multiply the denominator and the numerator. Okay, You have to multiply both of those by that same thing in order to get that helpful form of 1. So moving on to our next page, we've got a couple more things to talk about, and this won't take us too long. So here I have the square root of 48 divided by 84. So um, we could go ahead and we could expand that out and work with each side. I'm going to simplify this first because I can actually reduce 48 and 84. And anytime I can make things a little bit smaller, it's going to make my life a little bit easier. So 48 and 84 are both divisible by 4. Um, if I divide 48 by 4, then this really becomes the square root of 12 over an 84 divided by 4 is 21. Which hopefully you notice you can actually reduce even further. 12 divided by 21, those are both divisible by 3. So 12 divided by 3 is going to give me 4. 21 divided by 3 is going to give me 7. So I went from having this horrible, awful, or horrific 48 over 84 to now 4 over 7. So um, and when I have this as one giant square root, I can actually rewrite this as two square roots. So this is really the square root of 4 over the square root of 7. And hopefully you recognize that you know what the square root of 4 is. You know without a doubt that the square root of 4 is 2, at least you should, okay? So I end up with 2, and it really is a positive and a negative 2, because when I take that square root, I get positive negative 2. Over, that square root of 7 is still there, because I can't take the square root of 7. But remember, I cannot leave square roots in the denominator, so I have to rationalize, which means I have to multiply the top and bottom by a helpful form of 1, and that helpful form of 1 is square root of 7 over square root of 7. So on top, the positive negative 2 times the square root of 7 is going to give me positive negative 2 times the square root of 7, just like that. On the bottom, when I multiply square root of 7 times square root of 7, I really get the square root of 49. And that simplifies, again, a little bit, not a whole lot, but definitely makes it a little bit easier. Um, in 2, the positive and negative 2 square root of 7 divided by the square root of seven, which is 49, which is 7. So this would be my final answer. So again, I cannot leave this square root symbol in the denominator. That square root of 49, that is why I had to simplify it to be a 7. Okay, so let's talk about what would have happened if you hadn't actually recognized that you could reduce this. The question is, would you still have ended up with the same answer? So I'm going to go through a lot longer process this time, but I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm going to end up with the same answer. So instead of square root of 48 over 84, I'm going to break this up into the square root of 48 over the square root of 84. And then I'm going to move over here to the left because I need a little bit of space to work. And I am actually going to list out my factors of 48. That's what I'm going to start with. So I'm going to do this the first way. And 48 would be 1 times 48. It is also 2 times 24. It is 3 times 16. It is 4 times 12. And it is 6 times 8. So those are all my factors. And I'm looking for perfect squares here. My perfect square is 1 is a perfect square, 4 is a perfect square, and 16 is a perfect square. And of those three numbers, the biggest one is my 3 times 16. So that means that I can write the top as, instead of square root of 48, I can actually write this as the square root of 3 times 16 which we have talked about earlier is going to become the square root of 3 times the square root of 16. So I'm just focusing on the top right now. And the square root of 16 is going to be 4. So I'm left with that positive and negative 4 
times the square root of 3. Again, any time that we have um, just a number that's not inside the square root, we always just want to write that in front, and that's just making it appear correct, okay? Um, so then do the same thing with 84. I'm going to find my factors of 84. Um, well, 84 is obviously 1 times 84. It is also 2 times 42. It is 3 times 28. It is 4 times 21. Um, it is 6 times 14. And lastly, it is 7 times 12. So I'm going to go through here and I'm looking for my perfect squares. Well, I know 1 is a perfect square. I know 4 is a perfect square. Um, of those two, the biggest one that I have is that 4 um, times 21 because 4 is the biggest perfect square. So I'm going to go with that 4 times 21 here. So that means that I'm going to rewrite the square root of 84 as the square root of 4 times 21 which is really the square root of 4 times the square root of 21 and the square root of 4 is really 2 and then the square root of 21. Alright, let's see what we can play around with this for a little bit. So notice I have a 4 on top and I have a 2 on bottom, and it's a division problem. Well, 4 divided by 2 is, in fact, 2. So I know this is going to become positive and negative. That sign's still there. By the way, all of your problems today should have this positive and negative sign there, every single one of them. If it doesn't, it's not actually the right answer. Um, 4 divided by 2 is going to give me 2, so I'm going to leave that on top. And then I have square root of 3 over 21. So um, for this part, I'm going to do this because I kind of see something here and I'm thinking about these numbers, like I'm thinking about 21 and I'm thinking about 3 and I know that 21 is really 7 times 3. So the reason I wanted to separate that out is because I want you to see that there's a square root of 3 on top. And there's really a square root of 3 on bottom because I can break this down as 2 times the square root of 3 divided by the square root of 7 times the square root of 3. And those square roots of 3s are going to cancel. Oops, and I forgot my positive and negative there. So I end up with an answer of, at least at this point, positive and negative 2 over the square root of 7. And I believe that is what we had at some point in the previous problem. Oh, look, it is. They're both worked out to be positive, negative 2 over the square root of 7. So that means that after I rationalize this one, it's going to end up as 2 plus or minus 2 square root of 7 over 7. So without having to go through that whole process again, I am going to end up with the same answer. Very last thing I want to talk to you about is imaginary numbers. And I know you're like, oh my gosh, imaginary numbers are going to make my life so complicated. They're really not. So I know that the fact that it's imaginary kind of seems a little bit scary, but here's really what you need to know. You need to know that I represents the square root of negative 1. So what this does, like if I look at the square root of negative 16, I can't simplify this because there is no way to multiply two numbers or a number by itself and get a negative 16. But what I can do, and this is where the imaginary numbers or the square root of negative 1 comes in handy, is that the square root of negative 16 is really the square root of 16 times the square root of negative 1 because I can separate that out. And we know that the square root of 16 is positive and negative 4. And we just said that the square root of negative 1 was really i. So that means that all I have to do is wherever I have the square root of negative 1, I just write an i instead. So this would be my answer. It's positive negative 4i.
So you really don't have to go through that whole process. Like if you have the square root of negative 49, we'll use common sense. The square root of 49 is 7. So this is really positive negative 7. And because it was the square root of a negative 49, because you had that negative sign there, that means that you're going to have to have I in your answer. So that'd be your answer is positive negative 7I. So we have a couple other problems down here. Um, I'm going to pause the video and I'm these next two questions, the square root of 68 or negative 68 and the square root of negative 33 times 12 um, in the question section over to the right and it will give you feedback on the answers. But I did want to go ahead and work through the last problem for you um, So because it worked out really nicely. You need to make sure that you're reducing your fractions. Use your calculator to help you if you need to, but you've got to reduce these because this horrific, awful problem actually worked out to just be the square root of 8 over 9. And that's not terrible. So um, when you simplify that, the square root of 9 is 3. The square root of 8, you can simplify into 2i square root 2. Or sorry, the square root of negative 8 is 2i square root negative 2. And remember, anytime you have a negative inside the square root symbol, you are going to have an i in your answer. So that should be the same thing for square root of negative 68. Your answer should have an i in it. And the square root of negative 33 should also have an i in it. The very last thing I want to talk to you about is over here to the right. This is something you are going to need to memorize at some point. Um, I'm going to explain it a little bit more in detail later, but um, it's just a pattern that you're going to need to understand how it works. So I, we know, is really the square root of negative 1. Um, and if we were to mathematically square that, because that's what I squared is, we would actually end up with negative 1. And I cubed is really negative I and i to the fourth is actually positive one. So this is a cyclic pattern, which means it continues to repeat over and over and over again. So this is i, i squared, i to the third, i to the fourth. That would be the same as i to the fifth, i to the sixth, i to the seventh, i to the eighth, and then i to the ninth, i to the tenth, i to the eleventh, i to the twelfth. And they would just keep going over and over and over again, and this would continue to repeat. And we'll talk about this more in depth on Thursday, but I wanted to go ahead and introduce it to you today.